I introduce myself. I'm Tracy Page. I'm the aquatic educator for the DNR and I'm your host tonight. So I'll be helping moderate that chat and those Q&As tonight and then helping um, ask Christine your good questions at the end of our session. Our presenter tonight is Christine Seensma. She is the educator interpreter at the Odin State Fish Hatchery and she's going to tell you all about it and then all sorts of great stuff as we get into water world tonight. So I will let Christine take it away. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Steensma. I am the interpreter that works at the Odin State Fish Hatchery. And so generally I give tours to the public and school groups that happen to come and visit. And I talk about how important the hatcheries are and the role that they play in supporting uh, sustaining a fisheries. But also I remind people that public land belongs to Michigan residents like you and me. So what I'm going to do is I'd like to share a slide just to kind of show you if you happen to come visit my site some things that you can see while you're here. So hopefully you're seeing this slide in front of you and we have so much to offer here at the um, Odin State Fish Hatchery, the Visitor Center and the Hatchery Grounds. So if you happen to come with your family, we have a stream drain chamber that you can walk down and it's outside and you can check out. There's places where you can feed the fish or view the fish. We also have hatcheries that are actually producing fish and stocking them in lakes, rivers and streams throughout Mich Michigan. And then we also have um, our visitor center building which allows you access usually the store and restrooms and talking to interpreter or staff that are there. So what I'd like to show you next is I'm going to move on and we're going to see a little bit of what's happening at the hatchery because hatcheries are always doing some different things throughout the year. So here we're at the Odin State Fish Hatchery and we're in one of what we call the outdoor raceway buildings. And so what's happening is these technicians are actually measuring the fish, taking the weights and the mass, and they want to make sure that they're growing. So we actually raise rainbow trout and brown trout and you're going to see some samples that I have. And if you'll notice, here we have a small fingerling size rainbow trout. So we're taking the measurements. There's three technicians or workers here because we need to work together. And so one of them is actually sedating the fish. So you see this pan of fish and the fish are kind of on their side, like, hmm, they look like something's going on. They're actually sedated because they don't really want to cooperate and they're scared. So we're just making sure that we can quickly do those measurements and then we can categorize or calculate that information. So here we have another uh, technician that's working to take that data and we're like, hey, the fish are growing, they're getting larger, we might need to move them over to another raceway to break them up and give them more space. So I'm gonna unshare right now and you're gonna take a look at me for a little bit. There we are, hello. So we actually raised two different fish species here at Odin State Fish Hatchery and one of them is the rainbow trout. These can actually be out of the water so that's why I use them kind of as my props. And the second one is the brown trout that you see here. And so this is the other fish that we raise at the Old State Fish Hatchery. You got to keep in mind that we actually have six state hatcheries and each of us raise different species of fish. And so we are concerned with very much the temperature water that the fish have and also their source of water. Is it surface water? Is it spring water? Is it actually groundwater that we're using? And that helps determine the fish that we're going to raise at each of these sites at that point. So I'm gonna kind of go back to screen share and we're gonna take a look at this hatchery image again. And so hatcheries raise fish to be released in lakes, rivers, and streams throughout Michigan, which is a good start, but making sure that the location where the fish go can support them and wildlife is just as important. So each of us live in a unique watershed and there's actually 86 major watersheds. And then there's also smaller ones within those. But you know, what is a watershed in the first place? So let me show you some examples of the watershed. And so I want to give you a little geographic lesson here so you kind of know where I'm situated at. Um, so here we're at the tip of Michigan. And to give you a reference point, we're looking at the Straits of Mackinac. Most people know where the Mackinac Bridge is located. So you're traveling across from the Lower Peninsula up to the Upper Peninsula. And so the Odin State Fish Hatchery is actually located across from Crooked Lake. And a major city that most people will know, or I should say, a tourist attraction is Petoskey, Michigan. And so we're not far from Petoskey, and we get a lot of visitors throughout the summer, May through October months. So now you're going to notice on this map that there's actually different colors, and those different colors are representing different watersheds. And so our watershed here that I work and live in is represented kind of by this pink-purple color. So you know what is a watershed? So all of the surface water or precipitation that falls and snow in that region gets directed and it goes into one outside central point. 
So if it's raining or snowing in this area, all of that will actually exit and go into Lake Huron, which is rather interesting because if you look in the map, we are so close to the western side of the state but we have this watershed boundary and because of terrain and certain topography, that water gets directed. So what I would like to you to do in the chat possibly is if you visited the Odin State Fish Hatchery or the Visitor Center, maybe you wanna put down some things that you really enjoyed while you're here, just to let other people know who joined in. And if you know the watershed that you belong to, now is a really good time to add that in the chat. Because remember, there's 86 major ones, but there's also some minor ones. And so those are just as important because they're part of the whole big picture. So we're gonna to go to the next slide, and this is images that I have taken that are actually in the Sheboygan River watershed. And so whether it's Emmett County or Sheboygan County that we're located, and I want you to kind of think about your watershed and what's happening. So here we have precipitation because it's raining on the day that I've gone out. And so the rain is actually replenishing Crooked Lake, which is right across from the Owen State Fish Hatchery. The ground is getting water that it needs. So the grass is growing and it's also infiltrating into the ground and we have what's called artesian wells or springs here that follow along US 31. And so a lot of visitors and residents stop and they get their fresh water that they need. And it's kind of a um, addicting thing as you're coming and going from work that you can stop and do that. So all of these other pictures are still belong to that Sheboygan River watershed. But here we have a McDonald's parking lot, not the most glamorous, but you can see that black top is an impermeable layer. The water can't work its way into the ground. And so that water is pooling along with anything that might be left over from the gas station, the cars or that are there. That water then can make its way and run off into the Sturgeon River. So the Sturgeon River is being replenished by water, but it's also maybe in, um, getting some runoff from that parking lot. We have some natural woody shorelines. We have some manicured lawns and those can play a big impact in our watersheds. Here we have a small vineyard that's growing that's getting replenished by the rain that it needs. So those plants are growing. And like I said, 86 major watersheds, but we even have smaller watersheds inside. So if you kind of go even smaller and think of Odin State Fish Hatchery, we belong to the Pickerel Crooked Lake watershed at that point. So what I'm gonna do right now is I am going to stop sharing and if there are any questions in the chat, just to break things up, go ahead and you can ask me some questions. Remember I asked you, hey, if you visited the um, Wooden State Fish Hatchery, can you put down some things that you like from that? And if you know what your watershed is, can you also put that in the chat? Yes, we had a few responses. Um, we have a Lake Michigan watershed, a Huron watershed. Okay. Um, someone said they want to visit the hatchery, not that they have. <laughs> Um, I'm in the Shiawassee River watershed, so, and that goes out to the Saginaw. <laughs> okay. uh, we do have two questions. Okay. So uh, why do you only raise two species of fish? That's a good question. So remember, every hatchery is situated by the water temperature and the source, and so we have done very, very well with the water temperature here for the rainbow trout and brown trout that we raise. Now, we didn't only just raise rainbow trout and brown trout. For a little while ago, we actually had grayling that were on site in our isolation building, and they have now progressed to the next step, and they're moved to Marquette State Fish Hatchery, which we're kind of proud of to be part of that. And so we had the right temperature, but really need fluctuations in water temperature. So that's why they moved to Marquette to help them grow and to do what they need to do. So if you don't know anything about the grayling, they're extirpated, which means they're no longer found in Michigan. They're extinct in Michigan and we're trying to reintroduce them. It's a big project. Any other questions? Yeah, we have one more kind of on that same theme. So how many fish does the Odin State Fish Hatchery release each year? That is very good, thank you. So we release around 650,000 to 700,000 fish into public waters throughout the year. They're generally about 68 inches in size when they go out in the spring. We also release a graded or fall fingerling rainbow that's usually smaller around maybe four to six inches. That's a lot of fish and they go all throughout the state where they're determined to be. So, all right. Yeah, and our next couple things jump right back into watersheds. So someone else said they were in the Looking Glass watershed, which eventually goes to Lake Michigan. And someone else asked, how do they find out which watershed they are in? And I'm assuming you're going to get to that in a minute. I hope so. I do know that there was some links that actually showed the full watershed picture and that you can find your location and then you can kind of find out where the watershed's at or that you belong to. All right. Yeah, and we're going to drop a couple links in the comment in the chat. Um, a little bit later, so you'll be able to follow a few different links, so look for those. Okay, so I'm going to screen share, and we're going to go on to 
actually, I'm going to stop screen sharing because I want to see you guys. So I'm hopefully looking at my audience right now. And this is a little exercise that we're going to do together. And we're actually going to be doing sign language. I'm hoping you're going to sign with me. And, and when we get done, we're going to sign through there. So the reason we're doing the sign language is we're learning about what watersheds provide for us. So um, watersheds provide us with drinking water. That's the first thing. So the first sign that we're actually going to use is drinking. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your right hand, and you're going to make it like a little cup, and you're going to do this like you're drinking water. And that's drinking. And the sign for water is you take your right hand, and you're going to hold up three fingers, okay, and you touch them to your lips. So that's water. So watersheds provide us with drinking water. So I hope you're going to sign that and get some practice. The next thing watersheds provide us with is water for agriculture. That means we can grow our crops and we can also water our livestock. So the sign that you're gonna learn for agriculture is you take your right hand, kind of like the high five hand, you place your thumb over on the left side of your cheek and you drag it over. That's agriculture. So watersheds provide us with water for agriculture so we can grow food and water our livestock. Uh, the third thing is manufactured products. So we're going to make things. So for example, textiles or clothes or cloth that we need, we usually need water to help break those fibers, fibers apart. We also need to use water to help dye these products to make them the colors that we actually need. So that's a way that water will help us out. And another one seems like toilet paper seems to be the big push this year. And so we need water to help break apart the fibers and allow them to put them back together, whether we're using pulp or recycled material. So the sign that you're gonna actually be learning is make. So you're gonna take your left hand, go fist, put your right hand on top, you're gonna to twist it, and when you knock it together, that's make. So watersheds provide, allow us to make products that we need. Another fun one is watersheds provide us with an opportunity to um, do outdoor recreation. So that's things that are close to water or in the water. So boating, swimming, fishing, canoeing, kayaking, you name it, swimming, all of those wonderful things. So we're gonna learn about three signs for there. And so the opportunities for recreation for fishing, I'm gonna show you that sign since we're a fish hatchery. So you're gonna actually take your right hand behind your left hand and you jerk up, that's fishing. The next one is swimming. So pretend like you're swimming through the water, you're gonna be swimming. And the third one is going to be canoeing. So you're going to take a paddle and you're going to paddle through the water. So now what I would like you to do in the chat is if you can tell me one of your favorite outdoor recreation activities that you like to do that's closely connected with water. Last but finally, my favorite is um, providing habitat for numerous plants and animals. So that's my big push, my favorite. So what I would like to add is um, What's the sign for habitat? Well, I'm going to give you the sign for home. So if you make a puppet hand like this, you can touch the fingertips to your lips. You're going to touch it to the side of your cheek. That's home. So it provides home for plants. You take a flower pot and you're going to grow your plant up. So that's plants. And last but not least, animals. You take your fingertips. You're going to put the fingertips towards your chest and you're going to kind of slowly rock them back and forth. And that represents animals because animals need to breathe. So now we're going to go through the whole thing again. Let's see if you can keep up and uh, keep me on, on, on my toes. So watersheds provide us with drinking water, water for agriculture. They provide us with water so that we can make, make products. They also provide us with opportunities for fishing, swimming, canoeing, and they provide a home for plants and animals. Okay, so now we're gonna go into a little bit more about watersheds. So I'm gonna screen share and we'll go from there. So hopefully what you're seeing in front of you right now is an image that talks about different pathways. So rain reaches the lakes and rivers and replenishes them through different forms of precipitation. So there's some things that you can do. One, it can land directly on them. So that's precipitation either through rain or snow. 
two, it can wash over the ground and can run off or maybe cover over the blacktop or in impermeable surfaces like cement. Or three, it can soak into the ground. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a video and I would like you in the chat to put down one, two, or three, or you can spell out precipitation, runoff, or groundwater in the chat. So even though all of them are happening in the video, which one was I really trying to emphasize? So once again, that was one, two, or three, precipitation, runoff, or groundwater. And so the one that I was really looking for was going to be runoff. So we have the rainwater that's hitting the blacktop. It can't soak in. It's running off the ground. It's going into that sewer drain or sewer system. Now that sewer system goes directly into the drain to probably the Sturgeon River or this closest body of water. I'm going to stop sharing, and I want to take a look at your faces a little bit so that you can see me a little bit better. So some things that I would like to show you is you might have an opportunity to actually make an edible watershed. So this is something that you could do at home or with your students or with homeschool groups or if you're just bored and want to have an edible watershed, you're able to do that. So what you're going to need is you're going to need some graham crackers. And these graham crackers are going to be the base of your watershed and you can use frosting to stick them together if you want to make them larger or smaller. The sky is the limit, up to you. Besides that, to actually build your watershed, you're going to be using possibly Rice Krispie treats or frosting. So you can see that I have frosting and I have it in the tube-like containers. So some of the basic colors you're going to need is blue, brown, green, and I actually had some white here to actually make some snow. So I'm going to show you a little bit of my three-dimensional masterpiece. So this is my example of the watershed that I made. It's a little crazy, but what I'm hoping I'd like you to do is um, when you're done, you take a picture of it, maybe you talk about what you put on there, and then you get to eat it. But keep in mind, uh, your poop is going to be blue-green after this. So I'm gonna um, actually take time to take some questions. So you can ask questions about the hatchery, you can ask questions about watershed, you can ask questions about my job, and we'll go from there. So do we have any questions in the question and answer, or do we have any questions from the audience at this point? We do have another one. Um, so when are those fish stocked? You talked about it a little bit, but could you go back over like when different species are stocked? That is a very good question. So we have two windows of opportunity to stock fish, and we can stock them in the spring of the year, or we can stock them in the fall of the year. That's when the water temperature is close to what they're accustomed to. And so that's why we have those opportunities to do that. So if you stock them in the summer, that water temperature is too warm, they're not gonna do very well. Um, so remember trout like it cooler, cool temperatures and a lot of dissolved oxygen. Do we have any other questions? We do, one just came in. Uh, what happens if the watershed floods? That is a good question. So if the watershed floods, and we've had a lot of that lately, uh, sometimes the water can go in places that we don't predict. And what it can also do is it can take along debris and things that go with that. The fish hopefully will find an area that they need to go that is safe, but it's really turbulent. Um, and it does affect, you know, sometimes in negative ways, wildlife and humans at that point. But um, rain is rain and you can't always predict what's going to happen and hopefully in the future I would recommend if you're having trouble with banks overflowing and things like that, you may want to build buffer zones. You want, may want to make sure any um, residents or anything are farther away to give you and your family kind of a safe spot. After this, any more questions? Because I can return and we're going to go to a little bit more on watersheds. That's it. Go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move on to the next. Here's my favorite part. So if you happen to visit the Odin State Fish Hatchery Visitor Center, there's a spot where you can feed the fish. And so we I have a video that I'm going to show you. These fish are being fed like pelleted food. So fish in the wild don't eat pelleted food. They're going to talk, we're going to talk a little bit about what they need from their watershed, but it's always nice to see the fish that are feeding. We hope it encourages you to kind of visit and check this out. <laughs> So 
this also brings us to some questions that I get. Um, this is not very deep water. And a lot of times the visitors will ask me, how can you keep trout in there? We can because it's spring fed. So groundwater is coming up cool enough. You know, you're looking at 46 to 48 degrees and it's making sure that those trout are at optimal temperature. If, we, if this water was not spring fed, these fish would not make it when it gets warm in, in the summer. The, the hindsight or the other thing alternative that we're looking at is when does this water freeze? It does not. So that groundwater keeps it cold enough or I should say warm enough so that it's not going to freeze and that's going to make sure that those fish um, are able to survive through the winter. So warm enough in the winter, cool enough in the summer, and it provides what they need. So we're going to actually step and say what are some natural food sources that fish need and they're going to find that in their watershed. Remember fish don't stay in one spot. They like to move around and they have to have access right. People don't stay on the same spot either. So fish are going to move to find their food, avoid predators, to find shelter, to find space. If it's too hot, they're going to find areas where it's cooler. They want to feel safe. They want to feel secure, just like we do. So you should be seeing a rock and there's some stuff that's on the rock. And actually what you're looking at is some black fly larva. And so black fly larvae are filter feeders. We know that those black flies eventually are going to hatch out into black flies that are flying around and the females are notorious for biting, but that is a food source for fish, whether it's in the water as wildlife and when it hatches out. So I'm going to show you, so here's some smaller little black flies and then we have some larger ones that are getting ready to pupate. So let's check that out. So one of the reasons that I'm showing you this is um, aquatic invertebrates that you find that's going to be any like possible insects or you're looking at uh, mollusks or snails that are in the water, they help us to realize that that's a healthy watershed. And so when I see a diversity or it means many different types, I know that that watershed's healthy. So I'm going to show you some images of some other aquatic insects that trout are going to feed on, so are other wildlife. So here's one. And this is a caddis fly. Now it's not the size of my head, it's actually a lot smaller. So if you look at the scale, you're going to see about the size. So this caddis fly makes its case kind of out of vegetation or bark that you can see. But each caddis fly family actually makes their case out of different things and that helps us determine what family that they actually belong to. So these caddis flies spend most of their life cycle in the river, but when they hatch out they're then going to be a food source too for other wildlife and they're going to finish out their life cycle. So we have caddis flies, Mayflies are a really good indicator. So they have three tail like Circe that you can see there. Once again, there's a scale. You may have heard of mayflies during other hatches. Here's a caddis fly that has made its case out of gravel or rock. And last but not least, one of my favorite, one of my first invertebrates I ever found is a stonefly. It has three Circe or tail like filaments there that you can see. And usually stoneflies are a really good indicator of cool, clean, high oxygen levels in rivers. So if you're finding stoneflies, that's a good sign. All right, I'm going to share and I'm going to show you mayfly hatch. So you should be seeing an image of, um, this is across from Crooked Lake. Obviously it's under a street light, so that's going to attract them. But this is a mayfly hatch and it can be a lot of mayflies. They're finishing out their last cycle. This is food source for birds, fish, you name it. It's a take all time. Not only when the mayflies hatch, that's when we get a lot of um, anglers that are fly fishermen and women that are out there and they're going to take opportunities and pick the correct fly on the water of their choice. So here's an example of mayfly hatch. Now um, you should see an image of a healthy watershed a healthy ecosystem that's up a river. What I would like you to do in the chat is can you please list some of the animals that you see on this poster? I'm going to go through a few but I'd like to get some more feedback from you and I know there's much more than I can cover that are in here. So can you please fill that out in the chat and I'm going to talk about some of the ones that stand out to me. 
So what I first like to point out is what I like up over here is there's a farm. And that farm, we know that there's fertilizers that they might be using. Um, there could be pesticides, possibly herbicides that they may or may not be using. What I really like is along here is there's a buffer zone. So that buffer zone is actually helping to make sure sediment, soil, and other things don't run directly into that river. And that's going to show some kind of responsibility of farming practices. But now I'm going to go through some of these animals. Here we have the raccoon. That's always the first one. And so I always like to point out another one. We're looking at um, leaves of three, let them be, poison ivy. Uh, we have some spiny soft shell turtles. So here's one. We also have a map turtle. We want to go on fish. Remember that we raise brown trout. So here I have a brown trout and it's actually chasing a hatched mayfly. To look at more invertebrates, we have a giant water bug that's feeding on kind of a small minnow or fish. We have um, a back swimmer, a water boatman, a caddis fly, a smallmouth bass, pumpkin seeds, an otter, a belted kingfisher, a cardinal flower, plenty of things that are going on. So remember, nature loves diversity, and the more diverse an ecosystem is, so that means the more plants and animals are in that, the healthier that watershed is, and the healthier it will hopefully under undergo any change that occurs, like flooding, invasive species, or things along that lines. All right, so we're going to go to the next slide. So we talked about watersheds, and we know there's, you know, 86 major watersheds. Lake Huron are known as the Lake Huron Basin. So here you can see we have a huge pink all of these watersheds there that go in there belong to that lake here in Basin. And I'm going to stop sharing so that you can take a look at me. So right now, what I would like to show you is this is an actual basin. It's a shallow bowl. So you have to imagine all of the watersheds are draining into Lake Huron. That's not their final destination, but that's at least one point that they're going to go and then they travel from there. So I want to make a characteristic or some similarities between a basin that you use and the actual watershed basin that you saw on the map. The neat thing about this basin is it was actually used for fish eggs. And so when we do an egg take and we actually remove the eggs and the sperm or milt from the fish, we would use these containers at this point. Now we use smaller buckets, but I'd like to show you at least some um, trout eggs since we're here. So let me get something for you. So we know it takes at our hatchery with the water temperature that we have about three months to actually be a swimming fish. So I'm first going to show you uh, right here. So this is actually what we call IDOP eggs. You're going to look at some small eggs in there and you're going to see two black dots. Those are the eyes of the fish. So this is when the egg is sturdy. If you happen to be doing salmon in the classroom, this is generally when you will get your eggs. So this is probably about a month old, um, 37 days when they actually get eyed up and we can sort out good egg versus bad egg. The cool stuff happens is when they hatch out. So when they hatch out, they go to what we call sac fry. So here you can see some sac fry. Compare that to a chicken. There's like a yolk sac that's located below the fish. That's its food source. When it uses that up, it's called buttoned up and it goes to the swim up stage. That point. So then when it's at the swim up stage, we're gonna put them in circular tanks at the hatchery. Now, we're gonna go back to basins. So I'm gonna show you the lake here in basin, once again. And what's really important is we have a lake here in basin coordinator that works on site. Uh, and there's a lot of things that this person has to be responsible for or work with. So we're talking about working with um, other stakeholders or other individuals that live in the lake here in Basin, making sure we have healthy aquatic resources throughout there, um, what are fish that we're able to sustain or supplement in those regions. And so we're going to hear from our lake here in Basin coordinator right now. All right, I will let him introduce himself. Hello, I'm Randy Claremont, the Lake Huron Basin Coordinator for Michigan DNR Fisheries Division. A lot of times people ask me, what does it mean to be a basin coordinator or to manage the Lake Huron Basin? And really what I think about is it's a watershed. It's managing the fisheries in Lake Huron, knowing that 
how we manage the headwaters of the smallest stream for Lake Huron impacts the fisheries in the main basin or the main lake. Likewise, if we don't manage the lake fishery very well, that can actually have impacts as invasive species or other things move up watersheds. Um, it can have impacts on stream and tributaries and inland lakes in the Lake Huron Basin. So when I think about both the upstream and downstream influences of managing fisheries within a watershed, I also realize that there's a missing piece. And the missing piece is what's in the middle between these two, and that is the people that live along the shoreline, along the coast, and, and interact with the watershed up and down. They're the missing piece to being able to effectively manage fisheries in Michigan. So as a basin coordinator, one of the things that I get to do is work with all the different stakeholders, bring people together to help address issues and really improve our fisheries in Michigan. Okay, so we're getting past uh, 5.30 and getting ready to wrap it up. So I just want to, re to remind you that watersheds are like a precipitation collector. They're collecting all that precipitation, directing it to one source. Watersheds have certain boundaries. So there are those high points in the land that help direct that water to where it's going to go. And watersheds provide water passageway or, or corridors for fish, humans, and wildlife to move. So at this point, I think we have some questions and we'll go from there. We do. So one question was, where do you find the fish that you collect the eggs from? That's a very good question. So at, on site, we have our parent fish that are there available to, to, for us. We call them our broodstock fish. So they have to be sexually mature and they will stay on site from around three to four years and we usually retire them at the age of five. So in our broodstock building, when those fish are ready, we will go undergo what's called an egg take. So we'll remove the eggs and the milt and get those fertilized eggs that we need to make production fish that we stock out in lakes, rivers, and streams. Any other questions? We have one more fish-related question. So you talked about macroinvertebrates and all those little insects, and then I dropped a link in our chat if anybody wants to learn more about those after our session. So we you talked about um, those mayflies emerging, right? So they have to live underwater and then they emerge as adults and come up and swarm the walls. But there's a lot of other things, right? But what if a fish ate only one kind and that particular bug disappeared? What would happen to that fish? What would happen? Yeah, that's a very good, that's a very good analogy. So we talked about in those relationships how the more diverse the ecosystem or the more diverse the watershed is, the healthier it was. So let's pretend I'm a fish and my food source is another fish that's represented by the green jelly beans. So I have plenty of green jelly beans, I'm doing awesome, everything's working out, but then we get some stresses, like maybe too much water, too little water, temperature change, invasive species that move in, and I start losing these green jelly bean fish that I feed on. I, if I cannot find food or move, I am not going to make it. The good thing is though, if I have a healthy watershed, that has about 49 different flavors of other organisms that are living with me and I can eat about 10 of those, I have a better chance of survival. So when stressors come, I might lose three or four of my food sources, but I still have six to seven that I can rely on and maintain. So that's why diversity is always a good thing in watersheds. That's great. So we don't want to hold anybody if they need to leave. So I want to show a couple quick things and then we can get to some more questions. So if you have more questions, drop those in the Q&A. And then um, I wanted to show you a few resources we have. So one is our Nature at School programs. That's probably where you found the sign up for this webinar. Um, but we also have ones for organized classrooms. So if you're part of a classroom, your teacher can sign up for a session. And you can also sign up for more webinars like this. So that's at our Nature at School. We also have Nature at Home, and this link um, leads you to activities and videos and all sorts of great content to do cool nature stuff at home. So maybe some of it's hands-on, some of it might just be learning, but lots of very cool resources. And that one is called Nature at Home. And then our last one is our Facebook page. It's My Nature DNR, MI like Michigan. And this is a Facebook page with just fun nature content every day of the week. So we have um, Michigan Mondays where you learn about a cool site in Michigan and Wildlife Wednesdays where you can learn about a species that lives in Michigan and lots of other fun content. So definitely be sure to check that out on Facebook. So we can go back and see if we have a couple more questions and we do. So one is, does the water in the Great Lakes go anywhere or is that the end? 
Actually, it does flow, and as it's flowing, it does eventually make its way out into the, into the ocean. So water isn't staying in the same spot, but it is moving from kind of point A to point B at that point. Uh, do we have another question? We have one more. Um, can we watch the DNR release fish? Um, that's a good question. There are times when they're releasing fish in areas where they make it public. Um, currently, we haven't been able to do that in the current scenario, but if we are actually releasing or stocking fish in certain locations, the public is welcome to come down and watch at a safe distance at that point, definitely. Um, I also would like to let you know that if you enjoyed this program, that our funding comes from the sale of fishing licenses. So that helps sustain and restore fish populations. It helps um, world-class fishing. It also um, allows for the things that we love in Michigan and enjoy. So if you've participated, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Any other questions? That's it. So well, I wanna remind everybody, we've got these three websites and I will drop those in the chat. Um, and I wanna thank you for being here. It was so nice having all of you attend and please do sign up for some of our future webinars. Um, there's a lot of great topics coming up and there'll be more starting in January. So please join us for something else. We wanna thank you all for being here and we will see you soon at another webinar. Thank you. Thank you.